kids in the neighborhood would come up to me and say, hey, Andy, they're saying your brother's name in a song. I was like, oh, really? That's, that's crazy. Bo's hanging back, he Tommy Hilfiger top gear. This guy Tommy Hilfiger, this is Prada. You are listening to Notables, an education through music podcast. Our guest today, as you could probably tell from what you just heard, is Andy Hilfiger. The idea behind Notables is to sit down with notable figures from within the music industry or from adjacent to the music industry and hear from them about their early experiences with music. Andy Hilfiger has been blurring the lines between music and fashion for decades, which has given him the unique opportunity to style and create brands for some of the world's biggest stars. Andy, thanks so much for being here. Yeah, oh, thanks for having me. So I'm wondering if you could start off by just telling us a little bit about how you became a musician. I'm from a large family. Mm-hmm. There's nine kids in our family. There was always music in the house. We were in my sister's room, she was playing Cat Stevens and Carol King. My brother Billy's room was the Allman Brothers. Mm. Uh, Tommy, Tommy Hilfiger. <laughs> he was listening to Hendrix and the Stones. And my father would love the big bands, stuff like that. So music was always a part of our lives. In grade school, I took trumpet for a little bit, but I really wanted to play rock and roll. Yeah. I saw the Rolling Stones and the, the Beatles albums, and I used to stare at the album covers saying, I want to do this. My brother, Tommy, bought a bass. He had a little boutique clothing store that was all about music and fashion, but um, I was nine or 10 years old, and he actually bought a bass, and everybody in the family would pick the bass up and start fooling around with it. Tommy knew two songs. He knew Badge and Sunshine of Your Love. And Billy knew a couple of Rolling Stones, so I picked up from them. I started playing in bands, you know, in high school, and my brother Billy and I had a band together. And Tommy used to dress us in cool clothing, you know, fashion stuff when we went on stage. He'd also get us gigs. What I'm hearing that I think is so cool is that family life was where a lot of the music was was coming from. And and, and you've got like a few different generations of of music that like from the big bands to Hendrix and I was also in chorus. We called it you know, the choir chorus for a while. And I wasn't great and singing or at least the teachers thought I wasn't so (laughs) it always kind of made me feel like oh I can't sing but I started singing and playing together with my band and the bass and now uh looking back I wish that I would have stayed in chorus because you learn a lot from that but the whole growing up in a large family everybody was into music it's all about music and uh, eventually all about music and fashion I'm curious to hear a little more about that. Some, something that I picked up on that I thought was interesting that you were you were looking at the album covers and thinking about wanting to do that. And that's that I think is an interesting distinction yeah. knowing what I know about your uh, well, that's experience how, in design. That's really how Tommy got into fashion is looking at like, oh my God, look at these, you know, look at what Jimi Hendrix is wearing. Look right. at the, the Rolling Stones have on. And I would do the same. I remember there was a greatest hits Rolling Stones record called High Tide of Green Grass, and it had a picture book in it. And it was so cool, the clothing and then the music, I can't get no satisfaction. You know, I've been obsessed ever since. A lot of the kids in the neighborhood 
where we grew up in upstate New York were into basketball and baseball. And it was never really my thing so much. I wasn't great at that. So I would uh, come home and listen to the records and try to figure out how to play that stuff. Like mm -hmm. I learned by ear. I mean, I knew the notes and stuff like that from the trumpet, but it wasn't the same on, on the guitar and the bass. Right. And so I would listen to what they were doing and try to do the same thing. And then I would make up my own songs that were similar. Yeah. <laughs> this integration of the image and also the, the sound is it's... It was the image and the sound. And um, actually years later, my brother became a fashion designer and uh, now worldwide fashion designer. But at that time, he said, Andy, maybe, you know, you could dress musicians in my clothes. You know, it was his idea, like, let's, let's get musicians dressed. But the clothing wasn't really right for rock and roll and a little bit. But um, one of my first jobs was to take Iman, David Bowie's mm -hmm. wife, to the warehouse. Another day I went to Mick Jagger's doorman and we just trying to get the, this clothing on everybody. Well, kids in the neighborhood would come up to me. I lived on the upper, upper West side and say, Hey, Andy, they're saying your brother's name in a song. I was like, Oh really? That's, that's crazy. And they would play me this song. So I uh, took the cassette tape to Tommy's apartment mm -hmm. and said, listen to this. And they were, rapping about Tommy Hilfiger. Right. <laughs> and uh, the company really became pretty cool. Like, oh my God, you know, it's Hilfiger in the songs. So then I started uh, dressing a lot of people, a lot of musicians in their videos. And the stylists would call Tommy Hilfiger company and say, oh, we're doing an MTV thing or BET, whatever the case was. And that became my career for a while. Hmm. And after that, the musicians wanted their own clothing lines. So I would introduce P. Diddy, Puffy to a manufacturer, Russell Simmons, or we were helping everybody in the fashion music business to get their thing together. So then I uh, met this young lady named Jennifer Lopez, <laughs> and she wanted to do her own clothing line. So I signed her up. We did a clothing line and we did a fragrance that was global. Mm -hmm. And it was really, listen, we weren't the first, but it, we were really an early pioneer in putting music and fashion together as you see it today. Yeah. And now, I mean, now they're completely oh, inextricable. Forget it. And yeah. then I met Snoop uh, with my brother and my singer of the band, Michael H. And we um, met Snoop in an after party from the Grammys in New York and uh, Tommy said, oh, just come to my showroom, you know, I've got great stuff. So s s the next morning I gave Snoop Dogg my number the next morning. <laughs> As one does. Yeah, <laughs> yeah hey, listen, why? here Snoop, call me. And I figured out, I don't know if I'll hear from him, but whatever, because at that time we were dressing everybody yeah. for their videos, TLC, Salt and Peppa, Aaliyah, all these artists also rock and roll bands we were doing. We had a line called Red Label, which was more rock and roll. And so we were like the music and fashion place to be in at this time in the 90s. Well, anyway, the next morning Snoop called, said, hey, we met last night. I wanna see your, your, your gear, right? clothing. So he came up with a dog pound and uh, loved everything. We gave him a bunch of stuff. They went back to LA but they came back a couple weeks later and Snoop called and said, hey, we're in New York, we need some more stuff. I'm like, oh, we'll come back up. Mm -hmm. Oh, I can't, I'm rehearsing on Saturday Night Live. I'm like, oh, he said, can you meet me at my hotel at midnight? I said, sure. I lived on the Upper West and the showroom was in the uh, garment center and uh, I went and got clothes, went to his hotel Hung out, gave gave him some stuff and the, the guys. And uh, the next night he wore Tommy Hilfiger on stage on Saturday Night Live. It was his first big song and uh, the store sold out the next day. And really <laughs> that was the time where Hilfiger became, oh, 
that's cool. That's a cool brand. Right. You that's know, the brand. Yeah. That's the brand. And uh, then from that moment on, it was just MTV, VH1, BET, award shows. Um, why Clef was wearing Tommy on MTV spring break. And we went and dressed everybody for the fashion shows. And it was really all about mixing music and fashion about pop culture. And in one of his songs, which I didn't even know, he said, setting up shop with Andy Hilfiger in New York, blah, blah, blah. Right. It's on one of his songs. Um, <laughs> and an intern came up to me at Tommy and said, Hey Andy, you know, Snoop traps about you in the right. song. I'm like, no, no, they're 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 all rapping about Tommy Hilfiger and Tommy, and they're like, he's like, oh no, 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 it's you. Yeah, Andy Hilfiger slide up in the garden next to Steve Martin. We setting up shop on the East Coast now. Dog. And now for a short break. This podcast is brought to you by Education Through Music. ETM is a nonprofit organization that partners with under resourced schools to provide music as a core subject for all children and utilizes music education as a catalyst to improve overall achievement, motivation, and self confidence among students. To learn more or support the work of Education Through Music, check out etmonline.org. I'm wondering. To what extent your musical background sort of positioned you as a as more of an insider than an outsider to the well, to the music industry? What would happen is the record companies, the stylists, sometimes the artists, were calling around companies, mm -hmm. other companies as well, and they weren't getting a lot of luck mm. with other companies because it wasn't a thing. They'd call Hilfiger and they'd say, oh, music, that's Andy. Because simultaneously, I was playing in bands also. Right. And I was, I worked in video and before Tommy Hilfiger, before I worked at Tommy Hilfiger, I was doing videos with a friend of mine was a, uh, a lighting director, Gaffer. And uh, I just got it. I, I knew the culture. I knew how to deal with the whole thing. It's music and fashion. It, it, was just like, wow, this is perfect, you know? Yeah. And then, you'd, you know, two weeks later, you'd be sitting home watching MTV and there's Mary J and Method Man wearing the clothing you just gave them two weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. Um, we also sponsor, ended up sponsoring the Stones, the Rolling Stones tour, and they didn't wear so much the logo stuff, but uh, they were rocking some cool Tommy stuff, Lenny Kravitz, the Fugees, then a friend of mine called me. He was a music lawyer, but turned manager. It's like 1998. He called and said, hey, I have this artist and we just finished her video. Mm -hmm. And you know, we really need your help. She wants to model, she, we need clothes, anything you can do. I said, okay, and I was in LA. Actually, I was in LA at a studio that uh, for Quincy Jones, because I had a side record company with Quincy and his daughter. Mm. He sent me the video, I put it in, and it was this young singer named Britney Spears. <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, this is pretty cool. This is interesting. I said, well, I'd like to introduce her to Tommy, but I'll be in New York. Oh, we'll be in New York too. So Britney came to the showroom and I said, you know, Tommy, this is Britney. Her song's coming out, her videos are very cool, amazing. <laughs> Tommy's like, oh yeah, cool. You know, whatever you think. So I said to Brittany and her manager, you want to model in our ad campaign? We're shooting next week at a recording studio. Yeah, 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 we want to do it, we want to do it. So the day we photographed Brittany, that same song went number one in, <laughs> in CNN and VH1 and right. the Post, the Daily News, everybody came. You know, we had a media thing saying, oh, we're shooting Q-Tip, Mark Ronson, Britney Spears, this one, that one. So it became this whole, like, the next day in the papers and the news, Britney Spears was rocking Tommy Hilfiger right. for her first song. And right place, right time yeah. kind of situation. Yeah, right place, yeah. right time. And that happened with us with 
Destiny's Child and Beyonce, like I to told you about Snoop, and plenty of others. Yeah. So it became my new, my new career. And then, there, like I say, the artists, some of them all wanted to get in the business themselves. Mm -hmm. And we were giving them great advice and helping out with that. But uh, I'd look at it and like, oh, my God, you know. Sean John Puffy's lines, you know, three hundred million dollars. I, you know, let's get into this. Right. And uh, so I signed Jennifer Lopez, and we built a business together, and had fragrances and the velour suits and the whole thing. Just thinking back to a time when this wasn't a when this didn't exist, like the affiliation between musical artists and and fashion. I it is one of those things that seems so obvious now, yeah. but I guess being, having the idea. No, is I the, mean, it wasn't, the fragrance companies were like, you know, I mean, we, of course, we weren't the first. Uh, there was Elizabeth Taylor or Isabel Rossellini or what, there was designer celebrity fragrances, mm -hmm. let's say, but there wasn't like pop culture. Right. Like it wasn't, they didn't have their own lines. Right. their own clothing lines. And uh, I took my experience from music and fashion and put that to doing this whole new life. Then eventually I did my own line. And of course, they know Tommy, they don't really know me, but so Macy's was like, well, who are you gonna um, have, you know, be your spokesperson, your model? I said, oh, I've been talking to this guy, Steven Tyler. They're like, <laughs> oh. Oh, we know him. Yeah. So then, <laughs> Steven and I did a partnership together and um, we were launching the line and Steven, I said, you know, let's do a fashion show at Macy's. That's what you do or a personal appearance. He said, no, no, no. I want to go in the windows of Macy's and we, when people buy, walk by, they'll see me in the window. <laughs> and we did that and it was like just a cool PR stunt. Right. And it was uh, called Andrew Charles by Andy Hilfiger, but right, really right. Andrew Charles, which is my middle name. And it was rock and roll clothing. And uh, had that for a couple of years. And, and did so, scarves and- Oh yeah, yeah, no, yeah. the scarves always <laughs> sold out. Right. <laughs> or they were missing. Um, yeah, no, the scarves, the rock scarves were the, the coolest stuff, but it was funny. We were on the photo shoot in, in LA and Steven had, it was uh, American Idol. Mm -hmm. Sitting next to Jayla. I hope they didn't talk about me, but because <laughs> you know, nothing's perfect. But anyway, before we wrap up, I'm wondering if you could summarize what your thoughts are on the importance of music in schools and, and that I think, sort of thing. I think it's amazing because, listen, I'm a guy who wasn't great in math and algebra and all that. The chance I got to play music, I, it's been with me my whole life. And I think it's probably one of the greatest things you can do. I wish I would have learned piano at a young age. I mean, I can play a few chords, but <laughs> you know, music education is is really where it's at. And you know, it's something they look forward to. Right. Um, and they can be creative themselves. And there's so many creative kids out there that need an outlet and this is it. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for your time. It's it's been great listening to these yeah. stories. I could I could listen to them all day. Really yeah. appreciate your time. Oh, there's more. <laughs> Next time. All but right. uh, congratulations on your podcast and um, education through music is uh, very exciting to me. And we're gonna have a great time together. Awesome. Thanks again, Andy. Who is one other notable figure you would recommend we have on the show? I challenge Frank Ferrer from Guns N' Roses to come on the podcast and tell all his stories about growing up in New York City, going to the schools, playing rock and roll, and now he's in Guns N' Roses touring the world for the last 20 years.